So good evening and welcome to this evening's event with journalist and film critic Jason Solomons. It's wonderful to see so many boys, parents, OMTs, parents of OMTs and friends joining us tonight from as far away as Australia, the Netherlands, as well as closer to Sandy Lodge. I'm just going to let a couple more people in from the waiting room. Um, so I've muted everyone um, except the speakers this evening until the Q&A session, but please do turn your camera on because it's great to see so many of you on the call. Before I introduce our speakers, I also want to say a particular thank you to those who donated to the bursary fund for pupils whose families have been financially affected by the pandemic um, while when you made your booking, um, because it really does enable those boys to remain at school and continue their studies. Thank you very much. So on to Jason. He was a pupil at Merchant Taylor's School from 1983 to 1988. And we're delighted that he's come back to us virtually to talk about his career as a journalist, author and film critic, as well as perhaps share a few reminiscences from school in the 80s. In a recent interview, Jason explained that his passion for film was ignited while washing the hair of customers in one of his father's hairdressing salons in Belsize Park, looking across the road at the screen on the green. Sorry, the screen on the hill. <laughs> It seemed to me that the, that early love of celluloid may have re remained a dream had it not been combined with a determination to acquire the skills to excel at the job. During this evening's event, current upper six boys, Samuel Stewart and Will Taylor are going to be putting a series of questions to Jason. And later on, there'll be an opportunity for you to raise your own questions. I would just ask if you would please post them in the chat to Merchant Taylor School and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible in the time allowed. But that's all from me. And I will uh, hand over with great pleasure to Samuel and to Will and to Jason. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss. Um, and thank you, Jason, for joining us this evening. I'm hoping that this will be as fun for you as I'm sure it will be for us. Um, as, as Miss mentioned, this love of film and and journalism seems to have started pretty early for you. Uh, do you want to take us through in your own words uh, that first moment in the hairdressers, it sounds like, that you, you thought about film? <laughs> uh, yeah, I should have been concentrating on washing your hair. Yes, uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you, Miss. I, I, call her, <laughs> I call her Emma, so that's, uh, that's something that can happen. But uh, yes, and welcome to everyone. How lovely to see some faces that I recognise, some names that I recognise. The faces have changed somewhat. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be back at Taylor's. It's been a long time. And so it's really, really lovely to see everyone. And to think about being at Taylor's, seeing you two, Sam and Will, has made me kind of remember what it was like that, that sixth form year. Um, yeah, I, did, I was working in my dad's salon and opposite was this, uh, this great cinema, the screen on the hill. Uh, it's now the everyman screen on the hill, but they kept that. And they used to, very old school, they used to get up and change the letters. Some bloke used to get up on a ladder and he'd go up there and every week he would sort of change the for the coming attraction, spell it out. And it sort of was, I could see him doing it. And it was a bit of a game to kind of work out which film he was, he was spelling out. So I would look and, and then see uh, the name coming up there. And I would, in my lunch hour, there was a budgins there. You go and get your sandwich. And I would go across and they would put up also in these little sort of boxes, uh, film reviews from The Guardian, from uh, Alex Walker in the Evening Stand and Nigel Andrews in the FT, um, Derek Malcolm in The Guardian and Philip Prench in The Observer. And they would put their reviews up. Uh, and I was at the sort of same time eager to see the film, but I was at the same time keen to read the review. So uh, funnily enough, it was, it was at the same time, it, they, they came together, this sort of love of this, this shot opposite my dad's shot where this was going on. Meanwhile, I was really enjoying being in my dad's shop in case he's watching, I did love it. Um, but uh, that was the dream. I thought, how romantic, this is amazing. Well, the, the, the magic of this old picture house. Uh, and one of the first films that I remember seeing there was Woody Allen's Purple Rose of Cairo. Now in that film, it's a, one of my favorite films still, I love it. 
And in that film, there's a scene, regular scene, where the guy goes up a ladder and changes the letters in front of the picture house. And I thought, my God, they do it. That, that's what they're doing outside here. I, I thought for a minute it was the same film. And it's a film, if you've seen it, about a woman who disappears into the movies and the movies sort of come alive and come into her real world. So that, it, that was how it, it was all born for me out of, out of, out of seeing it there. Uh, and it was a love of, of the film review and the theatre at the same time. Uh, they came together. And would you contrast the reviews you were reading with the films you'd seen um, in kind of like a an early learning experience? Yeah, yeah, Sam, I would. I would say, you know, you'd say, oh, God, really? Is that what he thought? Oh, gosh, is that, is that the way to do this? Uh, often it would be like, oh, blimey, he must have seen a different film to me. Um, but... I would also very much enjoy the way that they highlighted certain things and thought, wow, that, okay, that's how you do a film review. Uh, so yes, it was very much, um, you know, seeing how they were doing it. Uh, I, I never dreamt for a second that, that I would get one day to do that, I have to say. Um, but I, did, I was very keen on seeing that done. And I did it when I go to the theatre um at sick form at school we would go to the theater trips uh, and i would rush back and go to the library at school which had all the newspaper cuttings in and look for the reviews and sort of see what the reviewers were saying uh, about it. it was that was very much a uh, thing and, and every friday I'd, I'd read the film reviews in the back of the paper i have to say i did the same with football reports as well if i watched a football match and i would then read the football report and say he must have watched a different game to me uh, and that was a very key, I was always very interested in those two methods of reporting, football and, and, and film. Um, so obviously, uh, before you were a film critic, you were a student at school. Um, and clearly you had like a, a love of film when you, uh, um, when you were at the school, when you were younger. Um, were, were, were there any clubs or societies at the school uh, that allowed you to sort of explore this love of film at all? No, uh, well, I didn't have a love of film. I mean, I love, we, we, everyone loved going to the pictures and to the cinema. I didn't have, I wouldn't say I had a love of film. Uh, in fact, Taylor's, I'm, I'm not sure. They even had a video recorder at that point. There might've been one that they wheeled in at the end of every term, like on a tray. It's like this big event, da, 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 da. here comes the television with the video recorder. And someone would like put a video in, that's their square box, ask your mum and dad, their square boxy things and you, you put them in. And this sort of film that we were allowed to see one film a term maybe would come on. So I can't say it was a love of film. We did have lovely theater though. We had amazing theater at Taylor's and I had a love of, of that. That was what I, I saw. And I think we're not alone in this. I think if we were at American high schools, we would have a love of movies. But British high schools, English high schools, uh, schools, we, we, we foster a love of theater first and foremost. And that's probably where, you know, if I'd learned acting, it was there at Merchant Taylor's. If I learned directing, it was there. If I learned reviewing, it was watching the house plays and getting to review them in the school magazine at Merchant Taylor's. So film just didn't even come into it. There were no societies, there were no clubs, as I'm aware of. I don't know if it was a snobbish thing or just a sort of technical thing that they couldn't get their heads around. Um, but, you know, the three VHSs that I managed to see at Taylor's, I, I remember one very clearly was uh, a, a Fassbinder film shown by our German teacher, Mr. Corns, called uh, Fear Eats the Soul. Angst ist der Seele auf. Um, and it was, it, it's still quite a radical film. So he must have snuck that one in and thought, well, I'm going to show these kids my sort of student film thing. And it's a quite a radical film about a, 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 a German gastarbeiter comes to stay and has an affair uh, with a woman. It's got sex in it and everything. It was, it was a bit like, I don't think we were supposed to see that film, to be honest with you. But we did. As so, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, go on, Will. I was going to ask, so um, at what point um, would you say that you did fall in love with film then? And especially what point did you decide that you, it was something you wanted to pursue professionally? Um, I'd, uh, deciding it, I, it was sort of decided for me if I would pursue it professionally, to be honest with you, a bit later. But I fell in love with film properly uh, when I lived in Paris on my year abroad uh, at, uh, at university. So we, well, I did a language degree after Taylor's uh, and in that you get a year abroad, which is the best. That's why I did it, because you get to go live in Paris for a year or wherever you want to live. So I did that. And that's when I fell in love with 
cinema. I went every day with with a different person. I I didn't have much work to do, but I did my school work teaching in a school. And then you would go to a cinema. And Paris is full of cinemas showing films at all times of the day. Classic films, new films, and they love films. It's not like oh, there's a rubbish Sylvester Stallone film. They they make every rubbish film into a big art. You know, it's like, ah, it's a new comedy from uh, Rob Reiner. Oh, it's important. And I fell in love with respecting that and, and, and just having that there to go to. That was, that was where I absolutely fell in love with film as a culture. I don't think the UK, for all its sort of history of film, really sort of elevated it to an art. And in France, it's, it's one of the arts, the septième art, the seventh art. And, and that's where I discovered that and definitely fell in love with it. I'm not saying I hadn't fallen in love countless times with people on the screen. If you want, you know, I fell in love with Rebecca De Mornay in Risky Business. I, I was in love with Diane Keaton in, uh, in Annie Hall. Um, I was in love with Barbara Hershey in Hannah and the Sisters. I was in love with, who was in Mannequin? It, basically, it, lots of people on the screen I'd fallen in love with, but that was mainly women and, uh, and they're the sort of the iconography of great stars on the screen. Uh, uh, so I fell in love a lot, but not with film itself or with cinema as a, as a concept. But I was very happy, like Mia Farrow in that film, I'd said Perk Rosakari to fall in love and actually sort of seep into the, the screen itself. I've always loved the size of that big screen since my grandpa took me to saw, see Snow White and the Seven Dwarves at the Hendon Classic. You mentioned the, um, the English films you saw as a kid and then the German film you saw and then the French films you saw while, while in Paris. And you talked a bit about the kind of big cultural difference between the Parisian approach to films and, and the English approach to films. Would you say that is the main cultural difference um, between the respective countries' approach to film? What would I say? What, what was the, would I say, would say that is what? Yeah, would you say that is the main one? Uh, yeah, the French, well, there's the, the French teach philosophy, you do philosophy, both of you are doing philosophy at A-level, which we, we didn't do. Uh, and in France, every, everyone does philosophy uh, at school. So for a sort of O-level type, type period, everyone's got a little brushing of, of philosophy. And I think that makes a big difference to the nation as a whole, personally, that everyone has wrestled at least with some of the big existential questions uh, when they're a schoolboy or schoolgirl. And I, I think, I honestly think that sort of has changed the nation and made them more sort of thoughtful. I mean, it's made them pretentious as hell as well, but it, it, it sort of, at least they can say Descartes without sort of, you know, without feeling weird. And it's appreciated and people, people respect that uh, opinion in France. I mean, they give it all the time. So it's just as well. But um, I think that is the big difference. And yes, they've always loved their cinema uh, ahead of the theatre, uh, I would say. Um, they, they, they invented it and uh, they're very proud of it. And they have a way of telling stories that isn't about, you know, a, a big bang on page one so that you're hooked. You know, they have a very uh, precise way of doing atmosphere and character and, and smoking and sex they're very good at uh, in the cinema as well. And, you know, they, they have this way of just conjuring up a, a, a sort of a, a way of life on the screen. If you saw, uh, the first film I saw when I went to Paris was the, the Jean-Luc Godard film, A Bout de Souffle, Breathless. Um, and the amount of cigarettes he smokes in that, no wonder he's breathless. So I, I just, but I just thought that was an amazing film. It still is an amazing film. One of the films you have to see because it just, the grammar of cinema in it is amazing. So that was a, a key film in making me go, oh, blimey, these French, they, they do things differently over there. So yeah, see that one. Um, so obviously, well, not necessarily obviously, but um, so currently you're a film critic and you, you mentioned that um, the, the decision was sort of made for you. Um, do you wanna go into that a bit more? <laughs> you know, I don't wanna seem, seem passive, but um, I was a graduate trainee at the Daily Express, was my first job in journalism, which meant I went round all the departments. So I did a bit of politics, I did a bit of uh, you know doorstepping and, and, and real news and car crashes and murders and things like that and going to the courts. Uh, I did diary, which meant you go out to high society events and kind of hobnob with royals and get gossip about them. And I did show business and I did sport. And um, I, I showed more aptitude for the football and the showbiz thing. I, I understood 
sort of the acting thing and the world of showbiz. I just loved it. And London was full of lights and things like that. So it, that, that was perfect. So I was a showbiz editor, uh, the youngest showbiz editor on Fleet Street at the time, which really pissed Piers Morgan off because previously he held that record. And um, I got to, to, to you know, do f interviews with film stars and, and actors uh, and TV people. And then just one day, uh, they, they had uh, their film critic was out of contract and they were trying to sign Jonathan Ross, trying to sign sort of big, big money transfer uh, from the mirror. And they were trying to get him, but he was stalling on the contract uh, and they needed someone to do the film reviews that week. And I, I literally said, well, well I'll do it. Uh, and I, I'd be like, it won't be as expensive as Jonathan Ross. Uh, and they went, all right, go, you do it. And I did it for that first week. And they went, oh, you're quite good at this, aren't you? And I went, yeah, I'll do it next week. And I did it next week and then the week after. And then I went to the Cannes Film Festival and that was it. I was, I was sold and they were sold on me and they saved a lot of money uh, on it <laughs> from having me. So from being cheap and available, uh, this uh, a, a, a career was born. I still haven't earned anything like me and Jonathan Ross, to be honest with you. What would a week um, as, a, as a film critic look like? Because obviously you're not seeing films all day, every day. How would you fill your time? Uh, I, I, there were, I mean, there were days when I would see films all day, every day. Um, most typically we would see them um, on a Monday morning, starting at 10 o'clock film at 10, film at 1, and then a film at 3, 3.30. So three a day. And then Tuesday would be the same. And then maybe there'd be a gap and the, the next Friday you'd see three. So you tried, could see nine or so films a week, sometimes in the evening, even a couple more. So there were three or four days where you would sit there in your seat watching. And then on a Wednesday, which has always been a day, that, has, that was the day you wrote your film copy. And that was the same for almost every national newspaper. Wednesday was the day that the film critic would sort of be there thinking and filing and typing. And then you'd get your copy in on the Wednesday evening. And they would, then the Thursday you would lay it out on the page and have a look at it and choose pictures and say, well, we need maybe another little column down the side. Say if you were leading on a film about the US president, say a uh, film in which Morgan Freeman played the US president, for example, you would do a little breakout box on five other films, five other great US presidents played by, you know, Martin Sheen or whoever it was, was a bit. so you do a little thing like that. And that's what you would do on the Thursday. And then, so yes, you were pretty much in the cinema all the time uh, watching the films, but uh, secretly we get to watch them in Soho. So each, um, major studio in Soho, 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, Sony, Paramount, they've all got their little headquarters. Uh, and until very recently, they were all in Soho. In fact, I haven't been in for about a year, so they, uh, they neither has anyone, so they've probably moved in that time. I know a couple of them have. So they all had their little screening rooms underneath and you would have little reception. So you'd have your tea and coffee and it would be quite civilized and you would go in and it wouldn't be like you going to the multiplex and there's loads of people eating nachos and coming late and shouting. Uh, it would be quite, you know, there'll be sort of maybe 20, 25 of us and we'd all be the same every week with some of those great critics who I'd read earlier on the wall at the, at the screen on the hill, Philip French and Alexander Walker, the irascible presence of Alexander Walker, uh, Derek Malcolm, Chris Tookie from the Mail. They'd all be sitting there all with their different, their seats because they'd all been there for years. This is, this is my seat. And if you ever went and sat in someone's seat, people would go, oh, that's Philip, that's Philip French's seat. You can't sit there. Um, so that's, that's what I would, that's what I would do for quite a number of years. And you'd go, you know, from each one to, so 10 o'clock you go, oh, I'm at Sony. And then sometimes you're in Leicester square at the big one, the fight, the best one, Monday morning, quite often with me would show the sort of big blockbuster of the week. So that people would be going, struggling to work Monday morning. Oh, and like, I'd be like, yep, I've got to go to Leicester square at the empire, Leicester square, a seat of fight with, you know, there'd be about 50 of us within in this sort of thousand seat of cinema, just having the latest blockbuster, you know, John Travolta uh, and Nick Cage in face off coming right to you on a Monday morning. Uh, and that was, that was why you do that job. Um, so this next question, potentially a little loaded, so uh, sorry in advance. But um, what, would you, what would you say the role of a film critic is? Um, like, would you say it's your job to interpret films for other people, or would you say it's just an expression of your own tastes? 
I think it's both of those things. I think primarily the job of a film reviewer, certainly for newspapers, is quite often informative. It's quite often like this film is out. It's got people in it that you will like and you should go and see it. There is a, a very much a sort of imperative to sort of say, do I go and see it or not? This ultimately. Uh, so yeah, there's a sort of um, consumer guide to it. Uh, element so that's one one thing that readers definitely want to know yeah, at the end of your review do I bother or not um, and you could do that with saying five stars or one star or three stars but in between that you have to entertain the reader very much they 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 they're, they're sitting in front of your copy and you need to entertain them you need to interpret it in a certain way from uh, I think a bit of information from an informed point of view so if it's the director's third film. Chances are they won't have seen one and two, but chances are that I will have because I follow indie film or I've seen it at a festival. So fill them in on the context within which, within which this film plays out, what the actors have done before, what the director has done before, what the director tends to say in his movies, and then you can interpret. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if they follow you, then they will have some idea of your tastes. You know, mine, I don't particularly like sci-fi and any reader of me will, will know I don't particularly like sci-fi. So if I do like a sci-fi film, it's got to be, it, it's a particularly good sci-fi that's appealed to me on a certain human level or, or on a point of view of design, for example, or it had a certain new view of the future that I hadn't seen before, where they even told jokes. That's why I don't really like sci-fi because they don't laugh in the future. So that's, I think that's the job of the critic to, to actually sort of put all of that and that we don't get 2000 words, you've got to do it in 300. Uh, what I learned when I was a football reporter was, this was in the days before every football match was on television, uh, is that you went to this match, uh, the reader didn't, tell them what happened. And that is still essentially the job of the reporter. You were there, they weren't. Tell them what it was like to be there. And I think it's the same with the film. I try and give over the experience of watching the film without, and I think this is crucial, saying what the film, hap what happens in the film. You say what it's about thematically and what it's like to watch it, the sense of it, the sensory experience of it, the atmosphere of it, the colours of it. But I'm very much against telling people that this person goes here and then he goes there and then they go there. I think it's really boring to read. And I think it, it isn't the, the importance of the movie itself is not the plot. Yes, it's about a girl meets a boy and it's set in Los Angeles. That's enough. And within that, they hang on all this atmosphere and all this stuff. And that I, I like to say what it's like to watch it, not what it's not, 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 not replace the act of watching it for you. Tell you what it's like to have been there. How difficult would you say it is to balance that uh, informed and objective opinion of a film or of a football match even uh, alongside trying to stay on the good side of some prominent rising director? Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is a balance. Uh, there are times, particularly at a film festival, where you see the first film, like the, at Cannes or at Venice or Sundance, which they've just had, or Berlin, which is upcoming, a film makes it sort of fold-like steps into the world. And it can be very tentative. And often it's the first time they've shown a film to an audience and they don't really quite know what this film is. The marketing people haven't got hold of it. They don't quite know what the poster should be, if it stars this person or that person, you know, who's the lead in it and it hasn't sunk it. So if you, if you then uh, trash the film at, at its first screening at a premiere at a festival, it can really upset the life of that film, the future life of that film. And it can wipe quite a lot of value off it. And I learned that to my cost. I have had irate producers saying, you've just killed my movie, it's not fair. And I, some critics would say, do you know what, it's your problem. You shouldn't have made a rubbish film then. But I don't think that is fair. And I took that on board and I have, I think at a festival like that, if you haven't got something good to say about something, perhaps not worth saying, unless of course it's like, you know, Martin Scorsese is covered with his great new film and everyone wants to know how good it is. And you're going, sorry, it's a dud. That, that's all right. But for younger directors who or producers or actors, 
you, you, you are going to have a relationship with them over the over a period. So, yes, it, it, there is a, a delicate way of doing it. And what you can do is you can. This is a trick I shouldn't. put. Well, or I'll tell you. So you now that if we give stars, you can sort of give a bad review. But if you give it three stars, they kind of go, oh, well, it wasn't that bad in the end, really. So if you just give the bad review and just put two stars with the same words, but just two stars, they'll get really annoyed with you. You're like, you've, you've killed it. You've upset me, I'm moving. But I three stars, they go, well, you can live with it. Because for three stars, me, it, it says, go and make your own mind up about this. It's, it, it's worth watching is what three stars is because it's interesting or because it's not quite good or it fails in some way. That to me is interesting with how it succeeds and how it doesn't succeed. They're both quite interesting, but two stars can really piss a director off. Whereas three doesn't need to, it's fine. So I've learned that. <laughs> um, this is leading on a little bit from Samuel's question again, but um, obviously as well as um, reviewing films, you also interview quite a lot of people um, on TV or on your podcast, sort of directors, actors, people involved in film. But has this, uh, has interviews ever, or have interviews, sorry, ever affected your opinions of films or, um, going back to the sort of objectivism, has it ever affected your review of the film if you've written it afterwards? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, and I, I think, yes, you sometimes get to what they were trying to say with their film. I've been with directors who talk a fantastic game and you think, blimey. Well, if, if you'd made the film, you've just said you were trying to make, that would have been amazing. <laughs> But quite often they can't, you know what they were trying to do and it just hasn't come out that way. But it is interesting to see what they were trying to do. So that happened, that happens quite often. There's a director called Julie Taymor, who's really famous because she did The Lion King. She put The Lion King on stage. So she's hugely wealthy and very rich. But, and she talks a brilliant game. She's not a particularly, her films aren't particularly successful for me artistically, but she can talk a good game. If she came in the room and you had like 10 million pounds to give someone to make a film, you'd give it to her and say, just get on with it because that sounded brilliant. And it never quite comes out that way. But to hear her talk about it is, is rather interesting. So yes, they, they, I don't think I've ever had my mind changed. What we do do is, is sometimes you have to book a guest onto your show and your podcast, your radio show in advance without having seen the film. They say, well, you know, Russell Crowe's coming to town. Uh, do you want him on your show? And you think, well, he's a big star. I know he's going to be difficult, but, you know, we'll get him on and we'd have to book him in because everyone wants him from Graham Norton to, you know, Woman's Hour, whatever it is, they all want this. So you have to book him in. Then you see the film and it's like, oh my God, this is terrible, this film. And he's Russell Crowe. What am I going to do when he comes in? I can't say to him, oh, your, your film's marvellous, Russell. So you have to find a way because he's going to beat you up. <laughs> so you have to find a way to look at the good bits of the film and be honest and yet still be honest about it and not say, well, because you can't start an interview. Well, your film was rubbish, wasn't it, Russell Crowe? What do you have to say to that? Because he will just walk out. So, yes, you do have to be politic about that sort of thing in in general, though, my rule because of that is never to do something with someone whose film I don't like. I do often Q&As, which is when after the film you go on to this, at the cinema and you say, welcome on stage, Gary Oldman, who was far, ma marvellous in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, for example, like that. And everyone goes, man, it's great. And I, I have done a couple of those Q&As with an audience and, and the actor where I haven't been that keen on the film. And those don't work at all. Uh, so I only do them if I really like the movie. And that's uh, probably to the to detriment of some way, you know, financial detriment of myself. But it just doesn't work otherwise, you know, especially live. You really have to. I, I love loving the movie. I love championing the movie. And I love drawing out, you know, stuff that I've admired about people's work in it much better than sort of drawing attention to things. And then and then if there is a bit that doesn't you, you can always talk about the failures. I, I had a TV show called In Conversation. And I would, uh, the director would come on and we'd sort of say, oh, marvellous, you were great, you had a wonderful this. But I would always talk about the flop because oh, in every director's career, they've had a flop. And I would always bring that flop up, not to start with, but to, uh, in the middle. And you know what? It would suddenly make the, the conversation that gives a little different colour to it, a little different timbre. And they would kind of say, you know what? I learned what I did wrong there. Or I learned I shouldn't be doing costume dramas. Or I learned I shouldn't 
be working you know I had the wrong team behind me I went to the wrong studio they find in the mistake something to come out so it is interesting examining the mistakes uh just not the week that they're out Will mentioned your podcast um seen anything good lately it's on Spotify uh, do you want to walk us through the the practicalities of putting on a podcast for so long and and getting guests on and all of that Yes, I'm still still doing it. So yes, I've actually changed the title for the new season. It's called "Seen Any Good Films Lately?" Now, sorry, I, yeah, it, no, well, it, it's not a problem. It, it, it's interesting because I did think uh, about a year ago. I was thinking people aren't talking about films so much anymore. It's all about telly and it's all about the Netflix series and the high end series. So I thought I'd spread and all the filmmakers that I knew, the directors, the writers, the actors, they're all, all the movie stars were doing telly. So I thought I'd sort of spread it out into, into that high end telly bracket. But I found in this year in particular, everyone's, everyone suddenly watched everything on telly. They've kind of drained Netflix and Amazon of everything. And every, you know everyone's watched every BBC series. So I found that actually my guests like talking to me about movies and about the film that they saw first at the cinema or the film that changed their life or the first French film that they saw, where, you know, like, like I was talking to you and, you know, the actress they fell in love with on the big screen. They, they love those stories. They want to tell your life story through film. So I've, I've gone back to, to talking about film uh, in that. I think it has that romance. It has that sort of visceral connection that people have. So it's now called Seen Any Good Films Lately. And I'm asking people about their past films and their present films, what they're watching. And especially as we're in award season, people are now going to start watching these films that are you know, up for Oscars and BAFTAs and Golden Globes, for example. So how do I do it? I, I literally started it here in this room because I was locked down in this room. I bought this microphone, innocuous looking thing, um, and, a, and, a, and a sort of, sort of, I don't know what you call it, a pop, sh a microphone shield that I've got here and a, and a sort of slightly bigger, um, sort of hard drive thing over there. And I started doing it here over Zoom like this to people because we couldn't get to people. Normally you go to what's called junkets. I don't know if you've seen the film Notting Hill, there's a bit where Hugh Grant goes to interview um, Julia Roberts and he, the only way he can get to her is this junket that she's doing at Claridge's. Well, I, I spend a lot of my time doing that. And he goes and pretends he's from Horse and Hound magazine um, and says, oh, are there any horses in this movie? And she says, oh, it's, it's a space movie. Um, so uh, that, that I, what I usually do uh, for, for podcasts and, and TV. So that, that world has totally stopped. So I started doing it at home and, and doing it on, on Zoom and audio. So that's been a... It's taken a lot of time up. Uh, I love doing it, though. I find the audio nature of podcasts very intimate and you're in people's ears. And that's a very, very precious and special place to be that you have to be very sort of respectful of that. And um, so, yes, uh, but I did do I did start. I did the first film podcast in the UK. Uh, I went to The Guardian in 2000 and six and said, what you need is a film podcast. And the editors said, what 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 is a podcast? Um, and I said, well, it's like a radio show, but we can own it and we can put all the Guardian film coverage into it. And I ended up presenting 350 shows for them over the next sort of five years from Cannes and from Venice and putting that all together. So uh, I had sort of experience in the, in the podcast field before. And then I sort of, then podcast didn't really take, uh, take sort of much uh, light. Everyone went to vlogs and vodcasts. And then about four, three, four years ago, podcast started we're going mad everyone was everyone was podcasting it suddenly hit and I was like all oh, right this is brilliant I've given up my podcast so uh, I thought I should get back on it and do it again and I'm really enjoying doing it and um, I'm really um, enjoying the people listening as well the response is really nice and personal and it and it's great and you can see it growing a bit as well which is a, a real relief <laughs> um so you mentioned um, awards, uh, specifically Golden Globes, and you mentioned Netflix as well, which sort of brings me quite nicely onto uh, my last question here. But um, so obviously with the pandemic, Netflix has sort of been doing quite well, uh, along with other streaming services. And with the Golden Globes nominations, they had, I think it was a 20 odd for both TV and film, which was far more than any other studios. 
Um, do you think that this is just sort of like a one-off because of the pandemic, or do you think that this is actually representative of the future of film just generally? Well, it's certainly not a one-off. Very nicely asked question as well when getting into your into your segue in there as well. Very nice. Thank you. Um, it it's been going for a couple of years now. They had more nominations last year than everyone else. Third in the thirties, the year before it was in their twenties. So they've been dominating for sort of three years now, and it's getting each year they go up another 10, 22 to 32 to 42 this year, but cross film and TV. Um, and as you say, so even in the film world, it's just 22, it's way ahead of any other studio or any other producer of anything. Uh, they produce more, um, it, it is perhaps why they've also released this year. So a lot of the studios have held their their work back so a lot of people are sort of saying well if we'd have been in the race they wouldn't have had so many not true I just I think that they are you know where they are the only people working at the moment they're putting things out they are they leave their talent alone to get on with it is what people who work for them tell me um I so is it the future it, it is a future for a certain a certain type of film uh they also do release in cinemas, um, which I think is a sort of a little sop to sort of say, well, you can still vote for us at the Oscars and the BAFTAs, because in the industry, there's still a residual definite snobbery. About two years ago, Netflix held a power party after the BAFTAs and I was at one and I said, well, I think I'm going to go to the Netflix and some people, they were like, how dare you? I wouldn't go there. If you, I wouldn't go there if you touch, if you push me, if you paid me, if you just, you know, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. I'm like, well, come on, well, why? They're like, well, they're trying to ruin us. They're trying to kill us. Um, and then the year after they won with a film called Roma, which is just a gorgeous piece of cinema by a great director called Alfonso Cuaron. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece that I've seen in the cinema. It's got this huge, beautiful monochrome photography, black and white, Mexico City. It's just a gorgeous film that frankly looks a bit boring on screen at home. It, it, it loses a lot in the translation from the big screen to the little screen. It really oddly, for me, doesn't work on, 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 the, on the telly at all. I've seen it three times on a big screen and I've been seduced by it. it's gorgeous. At home, I was just like, there's a, different, there's a difference to it. So I think with Netflix, and with the big screen, there is a difference. And I, I, this is, I, I spent a year cooped up in here coming to this sort of uh, reason in that with Netflix, they come to your house. You know, they're in your front room. Yes, you choose to put it on, but they come to you. With cinema, you go to it. You get out your seat, you make an appointment. You say, I'm gonna go and lose myself in this story. I'm gonna transport myself into that big screen. It's a different energy. Whereas Netflix, you sit back and it comes to you. It's a lazier uh, deciphering uh, interpreting of those images. So that's why I think people will flock back to the cinema because they want to make an active decision to engage with what's in front of you. Now, that may be a bit highfalutin because we're talking about people going to go and see, you know, Marvel movies or something. But I think that cinema will continue for people who love it, cinephiles, it will continue. It might become a bit more rarefied as a pursuit. Some people sort of say it's the new opera. You know, people are just going to be sitting there at, at Kenwood watching the big screen on their carpet, on their, like, like it's at Glyndebourne or some sort of, you know, elegant festival. And then the rest of the, the world will just be sat at home going, oh, Netflix. Um, but I do think that, that that is what we're going to see. Uh, so Netflix are going to try and give you some prestige productions like they've got this year with Mank, for example. Um, and they'll keep trying. Uh, so I don't want to denigrate Netflix. I also love the fact that Netflix go, right, we've got audiences from all over the world. They've done great stuff for Indian cinema, great stuff for black uh, audiences, African-American actors and directors have really, you know, been brought on by Netflix to the point where studios should be embarrassed by how slow they've been to react to that and feed that audience. So I, I respect Netflix for that very, very much. But I don't think that their model of trying to kill cinemas even this year is going to work because i think we still want to get out and about but you're the generation that can do it you know I'm my i'm still going to go to the cinema but you have to do that you have to make that active decision to go to the cinema but people said that you know television would kill off theater 
But if you go to Greece, you go or, or Rome, you'll see massive amphitheater. People have been going to the theater for years and years and years. Uh, and I think that they will still gather to go and watch the art form of cinema, which is now a hundred years old. And maybe those old models that the studio have of tentpole releases through the summer, that's what might change, but we're still gonna actively engage with the art in front of us. And that's what cinema is for me. Well, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, that's pretty much uh, all from me and Will for the moment. And I think the audience have plenty of questions for you. So we're gonna pass it over to them. Miss? That's I'm absolutely back. nice. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Can I just say thank you to, to, to Will and Sam for their expert handling I know normally I think people give lectures on this and I just thought, well, God, you don't want me lecturing you from here for an hour because it's a bit dull. And nice to have them. They did a superb job uh, of, of interviewing me, asking me nice questions uh, and, and even warning me when they might trip me up. So I think that was very polite, but they're well done, guys. Uh, there's a job for you somewhere. Bravo. Um, and they, I was going to be asking them to... Um, ask some of the questions from the floor but there are so many and they're so diverse that I am just going to go ahead and ask people to ask them themselves um, and if they would like to unmute themselves I will just uh, allow them to unmute themselves. So we've got a combination of questions. Some that are quite involved, others which might be quick fire. Um, and I'm going to ask Diane to ask the first one, Diane Friend. Hello, Jason. Thank you. That was that was really amazing. Really great talk tonight. Thank you so much for doing that. Okay. Um, my my question, what um, is? Has a film ever been so bad that you just physically couldn't sit and watch it to the end. Were you very diplomatic? And did you, you know, feign sleep until the credits rolled? Or, you know, has a film been so bad that you just physically couldn't sit there and watch it to the end? You don't have to feign sleep, Diane. It comes, <laughs> comes quite naturally, I have to say. Listen, that, that, that film when I was telling you that we go, you know, in the mor mornings I'm all right. You know, I've just got up, I should be all right to get through it. But <laughs> after lunch, you know, <laughs> there's a, that, that, that two o'clock film, it goes on to four. If it, there's a real risk of a like little sort of little sort of uh, nodding off can happen. Uh, and I used to think this was terrible. You end up sort of fighting it, you know, like your neck's going like this. And you can see along the row of <laughs> esteemed critics, you know, the head kind of goes like that. I and mean, you can see they go, oh, he's gone, took, he's gone. I see. I don't know. <laughs> um, so you do, you fight your way through and you try and keep yourself awake. But it is a form of criticism because it, if the film isn't slightly dull, you won't fall asleep. I, I always try and stay to the end, getting up and walking out, certainly a professional situation. It, it was rather frowned on. Uh, it, it's sort of a method of sort of public uh, protest, isn't it? So sort of, I'm going to flip up my seat and charge out. Like, this is rubbish. <laughs> but um, I don't think it's fair professionally. You, you want to stay to the, even though you want to go out and you want to look at your watch, you want to take a phone call or something like that. It, 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 it makes me not doing my job. So I, I, I like to do my job. I'm there to do that and that I'm going to do it. And also there's the bit, and it's happened where you kind of have nodded off and they say, well, mind you, that, that, that bit at the end with the monster that comes out of nowhere and just eats her. And you're like, what? So <laughs> you, you, they, they will, you know, your film will do that. And oh, no, the twist, you didn't see that twist. Oh my God, I saw it coming ages ago. And you're like, oh my God, there's a twist. He was, what do you mean? He was a ghost all along. He said, having woken up at the end of the sixth sense, missed that little bit. So you never know. I've just ruined the sixth sense for anyone who hasn't seen it. <laughs> so, so I try not to, but I, I can't say I've never fallen asleep in a movie. I can't say I've not been woken up by the cleaner shaking me and saying, <laughs> I think they've all left now, Jason. So oh, that has happened. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you, but I try <laughs> not to. <laughs> by the same token, has any of your colleagues ever asked for your notes because they nodded? And they, <laughs> they've missed the vital point. <laughs> they do. It's not quite the same as like, Hope, can I see your homework? But they kind of go, so we, yeah, they were the, So can I just, so what happens? So he goes there and then what happens? And you're like, is it because the, the storytelling was somewhat missing or have you missed a bit? You know, there's always someone who's missed a bit. And 
Yeah, it happens quite often. So you're not alone. I also think that we are normal people. We, I, the, the, when I first started, I was like, they know everything. You know, it's it's me. If I don't understand something, it's me. Uh, it's not. Often you think, what, the, what, what happened there? <laughs> it's a valid question, you know, and if you think it, it's very likely, you know, someone, your partner watching it might kind of go, oh, come on, you never get this bit, you know, but normally you, you, you shouldn't be asking those questions. The storytelling should be clear enough. Uh, it's great to sometimes double take and think again, but yeah, we do it too. We go, what happened there? Really? So, yeah, and it's actually one of the best bits is kind of coming out and, and, and seeing that, you know, other highly equipped professionals haven't got a bloody clue what was happening either. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I move on to Paul Burden as well? And Paul, I know you've got three questions, but could you please ask your top one? Uh, sure. Um, um, there are a number of um, number of film reviewers um, who often delight in being um, having sort of controversial views, often sort of deliberately contradictory um, to others. Um, who are the sort of current reviewers who um, you most respect and find yourself agreeing with more than most regularly? I think the older you get, the less agreeable you get, I've, I've found. And uh, I, the, the young ones, which I was once, I kind of think, well, they don't know what they're bloody talking about, these kids. They haven't seen enough films. So there's, there is that. Um, there's sometimes, there was a film recently that was clearly indebted to, to say, oh, um, The Joker for example, with Joaquin Phoenix in it, that uh, one in the best actor. And it was clearly uh, a rip off of, of uh, King of Comedy uh, and, uh, and, and, and other such Scorsese things. I mean, clearly references to them. And, uh, and I saw it at a festival, there were quite a lot of young critics there. And they hadn't, they, they didn't know that it was the, 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 the King of Comedy, which Robert De Niro was in and he was playing that, you know, there was clearly a reference to it and Mean Streets with all the kind of stuff going on in the, in, in the streets and the taxi driver references. They, they often had not seen those movies and had missed that out. And I think that's a real issue. So I, that, that, that sort of thing annoys me. Uh, and so, but who do I, look, everyone's quite professional now. I think back in the day, a lot of film critics got their jobs uh, some you'd get a job, uh, uh, you know, at a national newspaper as a film critic for sort of having been in a war, you know, been a former war reporter, and you, now you're limping, so you can't go back. So they give you the sort of comfy job of the film the critic. It was that, it wasn't that skilled. But now uh, my generation of film critics are very careful to be schooled in in at least film criticism, not film theory itself. We're not all gone to film school. So that's a very different sort of film criticism. The people who kind of talk about lenses and mise-en-scene a lot, that's a very French way of, of learning film criticism as a, as a sort of discipline at university or something. I didn't do that. I, 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 I learned journalism in order, what I said earlier, to report what's happened in a way. I still have that uh, element of reviewing in me. So yeah, I mean, like Robbie Collin at The Telegraph, he, uh, you know, he's a lovely guy, I know him very well, but he loves everything. I mean, and you just can't. He just loves it all. And it's, it's great. His enthusiasm is fantastic. But it's like, Robbie, it just can't be a five-star review. It can't be, again. So <laughs> he's not, but I do tease him about it. Derek Malcolm, who was one of my heroes at the, uh, at the Guardian for many years, he would always come out of a film and say, yes, it was just a bit too long. And like, and it, it would be everything. If he'd seen uh, even a short film, this is too long, he would say, of a festival of shorts. So, uh, and what he, what he did mean was that there were bits in it that, and he wasn't wrong. There were, you know, passages that were a bit dull and could have done with a snip. And it does, most films could probably do with 20 minutes less. Sometimes I'm an hour or less, like The Irishman. But, um, but, but I, you know, I'm not, I always say when long films, like, I, it, I'm not going anywhere. I've made a commitment to watch this film. And that's why I think about uh, Netflix at home. You don't like it, you just turn it off or you, you get distracted. If you go to the cinema, you've made a commitment. You, you know how long it is. It's two and a half hours. That's what I'm doing tonight. Now, that's, that's what I like. So um, I think I've digressed from the, the reviewers that, uh, that, that I like, but um, who else is good? Um, well, there's a whole you know, the Little White Lies community of young film critics who are trying to become what the French have the Cahier du Cinema, 
this kind of this very famous magazine that gave us the directors Goddard and Truffaut and it all came through that they're trying to Little White Lies are set up by a friend called David Jenkins and he's sort of kind of fostering this you're a young coterie of critics so if you're any young critics out there you want to go and join Little White Lies and get amongst them but they're very uh, consensusy. They're very sort of right. We've decided the cats is going to be rubbish, and so it's rubbish. I mean, they weren't wrong particularly, but they they went in thinking this is. I've heard this is rubbish there, and you could see them snipping away. I don't like that actually. I find that uh, I find that a, a, an incorrect way of doing it. You have to take yourself out of that that morass and that consensus. Sometimes you'll agree with it, but it, it is good to disagree with it. There was, a, I mean, Chris Tookie, who was at the Mail, he's no longer there. He was there for 25 years. And I just thought he was a sort of huge impediment. <laughs> he was just a huge impediment in general. He was a big bloke who sat there. But he was a huge impediment to the sort of uh, fostering of film culture. I've been very rude about him. But um, he was an idiot. And, and he was at the Daily Mail, this hugely read, hugely influential. It could He could have been so nurturing and encouraging for film culture. Instead, he kind of go, whoa, 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 whoa. ban this film, this film, disgusting, this filth. And I, I just, there was no point doing that. I just don't, I don't see the idea. You could say that this film is, you know, sexy or racy or controversial, but don't, you're not the moral guardian as, as the film critic. Um, that so I, I I don't really go in for moral guardianship as film critic. I'm quite libertarian in, in that respect. The more nakedness, the better. It, emotional and sartorial. Okay. I hope that helps. Who else did you want me to tell? Who did you really want me to have a go at? Shall we move on? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Alistair Cry, and you've got a couple of questions. Um, could you choose your best one, please? Um, did you have any problems explaining to French people in the early 1990s why it was almost impossible to see a Ken Loach film in England when most people in France had seen the film twice during its cinema release? Uh, it, it's still the case, you know, he's still, you know, he's won two Palm d'Or, he's it, literally, if you want to see a Ken Loach film, you have to go to the Cannes Film Festival, he, he's, he's third, I think he's 14 films in there, one of the record holding, now, they love his version of England, it, it's a good thing, but they do tend to think of British cinema as being just that. And that is a problem because it isn't just that. I mean, I love I love Ken Loach, you know, sort of the, to the earlier question as a sort of political critic, you know, that I, 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 he seduces me every time with his sort of slightly sort of syrupy, syrupy socialism. So um, it was, just, you know, that's the, the nice bit of socialism. But, you know, sometimes a film like I, Daniel Blake, which just knocks you out. It's just fantastic. But the French like to see us like that. I think they like to see us slightly down at heel, slightly downtrodden. You know, slightly kind of you know gritty. They don't really like the other side of it, and and I think it's it's harmed our cinema. We've either done that stuff, or we do the the posh stuff. You know, the sort of Richard Curtisy stuff, or the sort of costume drama stuff. There's very little what the French do. The cinema, the, the cinema du bourgeois. We we don't. We've tended to sort of shy away from it because those the, the, the arbiters of taste have sort of said, no, 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 no. You you can't do that. So I think, and we've also had a, a thriving TV uh, world where the French have terrible television, absolutely terrible, until until Call My Agent recently on Spiral, they've had nothing to laugh about. So they filled it with a lot of sort of middle, terrible French comedies and stuff like that, which we are spared here. But in the same way, we like our French cinema to be, you know, Emmanuel Bayard dancing around naked in a fountain or something. We, 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 we have a very specific idea of what we want the French cinema to be. So uh, yes, but the French don't understand why uh, Le Grand Maître Ken Loach is not revered here. Uh, and, and they don't understand why most of our national press, like the Mail Times, want to take him down. That's what they did in the 90s. They would say, this guy's a, you know, he's a blight of our nation. Every time he had a success at Cannes, the Daily Mail would thunder about him being, you know, being the, the man who hates Britain and, you know, criticizing Britain. So, um, I think the French like that about their cinema because they, it is a political act still in cinema and, and can be, and very rarely is it in the hands of any other. If Ken Loach weren't making I, Daniel Blake, I, I don't know who else would have made it. And yet it's clearly a film that needed to be made. I'd never seen a food bank on cinema. I'd heard of food banks, I'd never seen one. 
uh, until I then like, put it on screen so shockingly. And now, sadly, 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 they're, they're part of everyday life. And he put that in the, in the public consciousness for the very first time. And I, I don't know who else would have done that other than Ken Loach. Thank you. Um, could I move on to Dylan Shaw? Because you have a question about um, European cinema as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Jason. Um, hi, thank hi. you. Thank you for um, you know talking about your experience as a film critic. Um, I want to ask about something you probably do without thinking about. Um, but how? What's the framework that you use um, subconsciously to evaluate and compare different types of European film? I mean, especially movements like the new German cinema, um, you've got films like Angstes and Seele Auf, you've got films like uh, Die Blech Trommel, um, the steel drum, the tin drum, sorry. Um, and then you've got to kind of compare that and evaluate it just next to any old English film or Spanish or Spanish or, you know, how does that work? Yeah, uh, I, I'm a correspondent for the New European newspaper. Over the last four years, I've been tasked with promoting European cinema here in, in, in the UK. And uh, so it's, it's something that's close to my heart, particularly the French, but I, you know, comparing Almodovar with, uh, you know, Fassbinder that you mentioned there, they're, they're completely different, you know, they're, they're apples and pears. They're not even, no, they're not even apples and pears. I don't know, they're, they're, you know, they're Black Forest Gattos and, and Paellas. They're just completely different colors. And they, so Europe is a massive, massive, pot of cultures. Uh, how do you compare them to each other? I, I do think that they do have a, a sort of freshness in telling, a freshness of the way of telling that, cult that culturally comes out. Um, and I don't want to stereotype them at all, because I don't think they do that. But there is an austerity to certain Scandinavian, you know, we talk about Scandi Noir, that we right now the Scandinavians uh, you know, are the best at those kind of police procedurals, chilly snow and kind of, you know, kind of wrapped up against the cold, finding a body in the snow. We, the Spanish don't, if they do a police procedural, it's rather, rather different. So and it may be a, a, a weather thing. It may be a linguistic thing. Um, the Italians have a history of that which came before, neorealist cinema and cute little scruffy urchins running through the street going, Alfredo, Alfredo. You know, that's what you want from your Italian cinema. And my God, you get it. You get it regularly and we love it. And it goes back to Bicycle Thieves and Cinema Paradiso and, 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 and what they're doing now. Or you want a mafia film like The Traitor, which is fabulous film uh, by Marco Bellocchio, which is doing the rounds at the moment. You can find it on uh, modern films, I think. Um, it's just a great, great film about the, the, the mafia trial uh, of Falcone. Uh, and it's so Italian, you know, they just come in with all these kind of, you know, Sicilian, no, it's a, yes, it's, it's a Sicilian mafia. So they all look like, they all talk like this, but in Italian but, and, and in their dialogue. And you wouldn't want it any other way. And it, but the, 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 the vista that he puts on all these, these uh, mafiosi on trial is just an extraordinary thing. It could only happen in Italy. And similarly, there are French films that could only be French that examine sexuality or that kind of, you know, take sex to a different level. For example, uh, the films of Abdel Atif Kashish, who are, who are, which are very long. Uh, and then, and then we'll have moments of almost unwatchable upfrontness, you know, that almost challenge you to stare. And that's very much about theory of the French kind of challenging the gaze. So they they do have their their little specialness. Is how to compare them is it, it, not. It, it's like I said earlier to the boys. I think you just have to sort of set up the context within which this film unfolds. You know, it's a reaction to previous new waves in Germany, for example, or it, it, it's a you know it's a reaction to them. You know, if if a French film wants to do something different, then it has to kick against all of those criticisms that, that the, the, the French critics or that the, the new wave, you know, most French cinema is still struggling to get out of the shadow of the Nouvelle Vague. You know, they still try very hard, you know, to, to get rid of that, that Goddard sized shadow that hangs over them. Um, so then every new filmmaker is tied to that from Ozon, who I love, uh, and he is Francois Ozon. You know, he, he you never know what he's going to make next. He just makes the, the wonderful films that examine, you know, homosexuality, all sorts of sexuality. But they're they're sort of tender and they're sort of 
crackling with atmosphere and 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 then they don't even sometimes they don't even finish very well it's as if he's gone right i've sort of said what i've got to say i can't be bothered to finish this so i'm going to go make another film and you think come on frost i'll finish this but um but sometimes it's just gorgeous in terms of the atmosphere so it's the ambitions of those filmmakers uh yeah sometimes what you have to uh, I- I- evaluate almodovar i mean just just magnificent most of the time his most recent film pain and glory i thought was was a masterpiece does that help? I don't know what I can't quite. Um... I mean, it's a very difficult thing to talk about anyway, because. Yeah, well, thanks very... for asking a very difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of European cinema that's not going to go away. Mm. And, and, and Netflix are doing a quite job of, re- uh, of, of rescuing it because it, we're not yeah. getting it into our screens. So that's another thing. You, you, if you don't grow up near a, an art house cinema and every man or occurs on, you're very unlikely to be able to find some of these films. And we're not just talking about European cinema, we're talking about Vietnamese and Chinese cinema. They don't get the big screen. So it's up to the big screens to start getting some of those films on there. You know, they've got to, otherwise Netflix are going to say, right, we'll have them all. You know, and you'll just got to go, oh my God, you look at Netflix next month, there's about a hundred Danish, Swedish, they must've bought the, the library of some uh, dance film Nordisk program. And they are just going to flood you with a load of Scandi stuff because people like it. So that, that is the power of Netflix. So yeah, there you go. Thank you, though. Um, I think it also moves on quite well to Rishi Chopra's um, question. Rishi, are you there? Hi, yeah, thanks, um, Jason, and kudos to Sam and Will for expert interviewing there. Um, my question is, for, well, from one French uh, language graduate to another, why did you want to study languages at uni? and? Um, what would you say is your favourite French film of the 21st century? Um, salut. Um, I wanted to live in Paris. That's simple as that. I wanted to be bilingual, which I couldn't be because my mum was from Hendon and my dad was from Neesden. So I technically couldn't be, but I wanted to prove that I could be. So I always wanted to learn French uh, and I always wanted to live in Paris. It just felt like the place it just felt romantic and and the way to do that was a year abroad as someone told me if you do languages at university you get to live a year abroad and I thought well that's how I'm going to do this living in Paris thing um I had an aptitude for the language I did French and German um but um and I kept I kept at school I kept being a real pain asking when we're going to do Spanish we didn't do Spanish at Taylor's and I remember Alan Woolley, who was the classic teacher, just, and telling me one day, like when you're in, in fourth form, I was like, put my hand up, Solomon's, we're not going to do Spanish at this school. We do not have a Spanish teacher. We don't teach Spanish. So don't keep asking. It's never going to happen. So I did German. I had to do German. But I didn't want to go to Germany for a year. I wanted to go to Paris. So that's why I went there. And I'm very glad I did. And I fell in love with cinema there and, and, and improved my French greatly. And I had a French girlfriend after that, um, which improves your French even more. Um, thoroughly to be recommended. And um, what was the question? What's my favourite French film of the 20th and 1st century? The 21st century. It's a film by, actually, he's not even a French filmmaker. Michael Haneke. Uh, yeah. He, he I, I think he's an absolute master. Um, and uh, he, he's won the Palme d'Or twice for a film called White Ribbon, and he won it for a film called Amour, which I like. I love both of those. But my favourite film of his and of the 21st century is a film called Caché, Hidden, starring Daniel Ote and Juliette Binoche, about this quite uh, bourgeois media couple in Paris who find their houses being watched, and they don't quite know why, and they're getting sent these videotapes of their house being watched. And it's about post-colonial guilt. It's about uh, you know the, the the gaze being turned inwards on them, uh, this relationship coming apart. And it's a real mystery. We don't really know what happens at the end. You don't quite know. You're you're, you're going. They're, they're one of those ones. You're going. Where, where, who did it? Who did it? And I asked Michael Haneke, who did it? And he goes, you're not asking the wrong the wrong question. <laughs> I was like, oh, Christ. So that was very Michael Haneke sort of answer. But he, for me, is uh, he's an absolute genius with the cinema. The way he holds the fray is icy. It's icy and unlovable. But Caché is a film that I can absolutely say that the moment I saw its first frame, I was like, <gasps> I'm gripped and by this film. And it's just, just a masterpiece. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to Andy Ellis, if you're there. 
Hi, Jason. Thanks very much again for a, for a great evening. My pleasure. Um, could I take you back to your um, MTS days? Um, I think I... Uh, if you're paying, there, like, yeah. <laughs> a couple of years. Um, but uh, wondering what your uh, least and most favourite times were there. And I can gather what your most, your favourite subjects were, but any particular staff that you, uh, you, you found particularly good? <laughs> they were, uh, yeah, pretty, particularly good. Um, John Steen, Mr. Steen. Yeah. He was an inspirational English teacher. He would come alive. He would tell you the story. He would read, you know, you'd read out in class and you have to go around everyone in class. And some people were good at reading and some people were terrible at reading. And it would kind of impede the, the narrative, let's say, of Dickens. And sometimes John Steen would just say, well, I'm doing this part because he was obviously a clearly actor monke. Yeah. And he would say, right, well, I'm playing Wilkins McCormick in David Copperfield. And he would do the part. And he would come alive. He would tw I can see him now sitting at the front of the class, just twinkling away, going, oh, you know, Mrs. McCorpus said she wouldn't leave me. And she doesn't. And that's her. And I can see him doing that. He was truly uh, he, he let the, 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 the English come alive in, in his eyes. He was we didn't know this at the time, but he wrote for Gramophone magazine. We, we knew that he was an opera critic of some renown and he wrote for a Gramophone magazine. And many years later, I became uh, head of the critic circle here in the UK. And uh, he, uh, and they, they produce a booklet with everyone's addresses in it, you know, that sort of phone book. And I was just leafing through it one, the, the first year I was in it. And because of alphabetically, I got to meet Solomon's and underneath was Steen. I was like, John Steen, I'm on the same page as this, this teacher that I revered and who, who was a critic at the same time. He died just a few years afterward. I, not sure I had a chance to, to actually tell him uh, that that was the case, but yeah, he was great. Dennis Ogan, who was my French teacher, he was brilliant, was rumoured to have played, I love it, but he was rumoured to have played in the Scottish Cup final for Kilmarnock or something like that. And then he got, an, but whether that was true or not, or just complete nonsense. Simon Corns, who taught me French and German, he was, uh, and, uh, and, and put on a, a, a lovely, um, uh, he, they, they did he, he, Simon Corns, Julian Slater, and John Coleman, who was the sort of design and tech guy. They were they 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 did a lot of the theatre, and they put on these uh, productions of Cabaret, a West Side Story, uh, with the girls' school. So we got to meet you know St Helen's girls in their fishnet tights because they were Kit Kat girls, you know. So <laughs> it was um, this was a marvelous thing to be doing. <laughs> it was just the best thing ever. So highlights were being in those two West Side Story and, and Cabaret with the girls that we got to rehearse with. Uh, and, you know, and they, it was just brilliant. But also they are, fat, you know, great, great. I still love those films. I love those musicals. They are two of my favorite musicals. They're brilliant. Uh, uh, and I, I think um, we, did a, we did a Kurt Vile one after that as well. I don't know who directed that one, uh, and he's become a favourite ever since. So th those things they stick with you. You know, I'm yeah. uh, I'm a sucker for sort of German expressionism, uh, and you know, and sometimes lyrics, and you know, that Leonard Bernstein because of those. They they those are little germs that stick with you. So I I, I love that. I I love Mr. H Mr. Hill was my hat. Um, what's his Paul Hill. Paul Hill. Andrew and keep Hill, coming Andrew. out every. As Emma asked me before what certain, I, and I was going to give you his nickname, which is rude. So I, 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 <laughs> I can't remember the, their, their real first names. But Mr. Hill, who was my tutor and my house master at Walter, mm. uh, and the golf master, and I played golf at school. Uh, he was uh, very influential, very funny. He sort of thought he was John Cleese. That was his sense of humour, and he'd sort of strut around, sort of pretending he was John Cleese. Um, and uh, yeah, he was he was a, a, a very kindly influence. Yeah, thanks, Jason. That's great. Thank you. Um, if I could ask Catherine Bland to ask her question. Who's in the same house as me? Hello. Um, so you've talked a little bit about um, the excitement of the big screen, but also about intimate atmospheres and cinemas. So. In terms of venues, what makes perfect cinema for you? Oh, um, you've got your, you've got your you've got your options. The vastness, the big one. Am I interrupting your dinner? Nuggets and chips. Catering is important. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the vastness of the screen is, is one thing, you know, that I love those massive temples of cinema, like the, the Odeon Leicester Square, which is just great. And you can see the, 
the light coming back from the back, you know, the, the shaft of light, the motes of dust. And I love those. Can, the, the cinema at Cannes is 2,000 people and you're just in front of this, you know, the cinema should be big, you know, it's about these, you know, they, what they, Norma Desmond says, you know, the, 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 I'm still big if the picture's got smaller. This is that, this is what we need. We need a big, so I love a big cinema like that. So a, an old picture house that has that, that's great. But in terms of how cinema adapts and does it now, I think the, the boutique cinemas where you can sit together and have a drink uh, and make it worth getting out of your sofa into a comfy sofa, like they have those love seats at the, the you know, at the, at the Curzons and the picture houses, for example, they, they I think they're doing it right. Uh, and, and making cinema, the, the, the auditorium, yes, is important and that atmosphere within it, but the foyer has become, I think, uh, now a more important space for, the, you know, the drinks and the, uh, the, the exchange of ideas. There's nothing like a, a cinema foyer before a movie, I think, where you've got like two or three options and people are deciding what to do and deciding where they're going to go. And people are sort of, well, I'm going to go and see that one. And I'm going to see it. And so you've got different tribes going to see a French one or going mm -hmm. to see a sci-fi or going to see a gritty English one. Uh, and they're all, the, the place is thrumming with expectation and, and buzz. And I, those, are, those are sort of precious. That's why we want to get out of our seat again, to be amongst that, that chatter. Uh, and I think that's what cinemas really want to work on and, and get that foyer experience where you, you know, you can buy a decent drink and you can buy, you know, it used to just be carrot cake, you know. <laughs> We survived in, in the 80s and 90s in art house cinema. It was, it was like filter coffee and carrot cake. And they've upped their game now. But somewhere like the Picture House Central, I think, is a, you know, is, has become a real hub for film culture in London. Uh, and they, they really, you know, in two or three years, they've really kind of mastered the art of getting film fans in there, providing Q&A experiences, letting people talk in the bar afterwards about it. And it just buzzes with what you want from, from cinema, it's there to provoke a conversation. It, sh it shouldn't be quiet and deathly and silent. People should walk out energized by debate and opinion and asking people what happened. So that's what those, those cinemas. So if you're asking for my favorite cinema, Curzon Mayfair is probably still my favorite cinema mm -hmm. though, because it has that 60s sort of faded grandeur. The seats are fabulous, the, every, the, the auditorium is lovely. Uh, it, and it's just, it's in Mayfair and it's on its own and it's just, uh, it's just a fabulous place, Curzon Mayfair. Lovely, lovely to see your passion for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just looking at the questions. We've got four more, um, and I hope that's okay to whisk through them, Jason, because I'm conscious of the time. Um, and I will turn to John Schultz, who's got a, a controversial question as far as I'm concerned. It's a question about La La Land. Um, my wife and I went to see La La Land after reading ecstatic reviews from the critics. We thought it was very overrated indeed. I was tempted to conclude that it was made specifically to appeal to insiders steeped in film culture, i.e. those who would review it and those who would vote to award it multiple Oscars, using the simple technique of referencing many obscure films. I think I eventually counted 32 in a review that most members of the general public would never have heard of, let alone watched, but which critics and the Hollywood community would lap up eagerly. After that, I was less inclined to trust the critics. Is that very unfair on my part? Um, uh, no, it, it is one of those ones that divided opinion continues to do so uh, to a lot of people. Uh, so you, you pick the right Marmite film, if you like, uh, to get it. Critics do like seeing uh, references. You know, I give you the example of Mank currently, which is playing on Netflix, which is full of 1930s Hollywood references. And a lot of my colleagues have swooned because they knew who, you know, Irving Thalberg was and B. DeMille and Zanuck, and they, they know all this. So they think just by mentioning it, that it's a, it's a plus. I, I find Mank um, a bore, I, absolute. I, don't, I didn't like the film at all. La La Land, however, I did. I, I absolutely was taken by it. Um, uh, and there was, it was one of, the, it was a film that started, that opened the Venice Film Festival. Uh, and the Venice Film Festival was got famous over the last 10 years for sort of may, may, maybe showing the future Oscar winner. You know, it, it's got a knack for kind of predicting the big Oscar 
uh, runners at least. Uh, and La La Land unfolded, and, and I was I was hooked by the opening sequence, which doesn't refer, reference anything other than musicals themselves. It's this mad sequence on the uh, on the freeway in a traffic jam where everyone's dancing, and I thought, oh great, this is going to be fabulous. It's going to be a, like an old fashioned Hollywood musical, but set in in in, in modern LA, um, which incidentally is a land full of history and stars and iconography. You can't move there without bumping into the, the ghost at least of cinema parks you're under the hollywood sign so i yes it does refer to all those musicals that people refer to to the american in paris and you know there are dance numbers that re refer subtly to all over the place um but I, I still thought it was a transportive and, and beautiful film uh, about love uh, and unrequited love and un, un, unconsummated love that is still as valid love. So for me, I, I found it impossibly romantic. I mean, impossibly romantic. It, it was about the romance. It was about going to the stars, flying up in the, star, in the sky. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we, we dare to dream still. So whether it was the critics, just referencing films that you didn't know, I think that's unhelpful to tick off the references. I don't think that's uh, because not everyone will have seen them. But if it sends people to the old, if, if people have never seen a musical before and they go, wow, that is in cinema's vocabulary, I'm going to go and see some of those. I want to see a West Side Story. I want to see American in Paris. You know, I want to know what they're, what they're, where, they're, where they're talking about. And then, then probably like Hamlet, people will go back to it and say, well, that's full of cliches, isn't it? Um, you know, he could go that La La Land was, uh, was, was there first. I, I, I still love it, but I know um, it was on telly over Christmas and I just happened to see it and I tweeted because I know it annoys people uh, that I love La La Land and if you don't, it's your problem. And it was one of those that just got like 300 replies going, yes, and then about 250 going, yeah, you're mad. It's the most awful thing I've ever can't stand the singing. It's not even good singing. You know, it's not even good dancing. Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire, Ryan Gosling can't, doesn't dance like them at all. But it's about a couple who were steeped in that tradition, trying to live out a dream of that, you know, they were they 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 behaved as if they'd watched a lot of musicals, which they have because they were young actors and musicians, and that this had seeped into their blood. So if I danced and had a romance with someone, it would be something like that, but it would be nowhere near Fred Astaire. And that for me was what people who didn't like it didn't get about it. But I also get that people don't like musicals. You know, sometimes they just don't like them. So I don't know if maybe you're a big musical fan. And that would surprise me that you hate La La Land. But I do know people that kind of go, well, you know, I love singing in the rain and this ain't singing in the rain. Well, I didn't say I hated it. I said I thought it was grossly overrated. I thought the opening scene on the freeway was brilliant and it was downhill all the way. And I just don't think it was a patch on the musical it referenced, musicals it referenced. But and that's just a personal opinion. And I know infinitely less about cinema than you do. No, but you don't, yeah. I mean, I, 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 want, I want you to argue, I want you to say you, you don't need to know about it. I think in that one, it, you know, the references come in a, in a, in a flash and they, they come in a rush and you, they, 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 it is part of the romance. But it's very much a film about being in this romantic city and trying to dream and it, and it spitting you out. It, 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 it's possible to spit you out too so yeah but um yeah i'm I, you know and listen those guys went on to those guys who wrote that music for the for lana and they went on to write the next thing they did was a film called the greatest showman which i watched and i thought this is rubbish this is terrible it sounds awful it's all nonsense this is never going to go anywhere now the entire young generation it's their standard musical they love it you know it's their you know oh, this is me it's their torch song it's their, their, their it became a massive massive hit so what do i know thank you very much i love la la land <laughs> um jason i'm going to do some very quick fire questions for you and hopefully cover off all the other ones fingers on buzzers great of all your time Right, so um, which is your favourite film? Of all time? Mm -hmm. uh, I say Annie Hall, so I'm going to stick with Annie Hall by Woody Allen. I'm going to stick with it um, because it's too complicated to change. <laughs> um, do you ever go to the View Cinema? 
we, or which, similar multiplex which one yes uh we do i do i go to the view in uh in islington it's big it's on it's okay i see films in the view in leicester square quite often which is big uh so but I, do i drive out to an out of town multiplex no i don't do that we used to go to the wickham six that was the one when i was at school when it opened that was a massive thing we could hear that we just learned to drive 16 17 years old we could go out to the wickham six on a saturday that was a, the, one of the first multiplexes in the uk and it was uh it was a it was a real adventure but no i i tend not to but i'm very sort of very up for you know the 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 i've been to the one in uh stratford the big big new city westfield uh so i do go to those cinemas i, I don't i don't find i find them they I find that they, they're too clean. I mean, this is a good thing right now, but they used to smell too much of disinfectant, but probably right now that's, a, that's what you need. <laughs> um, okay, any tips for best film at the Oscars this year? Uh, I wish you'd have, whoever's asking me sh should have asked me this in in August because I knew this and then I still think it, that it's going to be a film called Nomad Land which will okay. win, so you should put your money on it. it. It was a long odds before, it's now very short odds. Yeah. It's winning all, I, I, again, um, I can't remember the name of the gentleman. It's not a film I love, I have to say, I, it's gonna, but I think it's been anointed that this film will win the best picture Oscar, it's directed by a woman called Chloe Zhao, who's a very smart young director. Uh, it's got Frances McDormand in it, who I normally love, and she won for three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri couple of years ago and she's in this again it's I, I don't like this film very much I just thought it's really dreary and depressing and she's in it acting and she's one of the only that everyone else is a non-professional and I find it a slightly patronizing performance but um but I feel that that film has got the momentum it keeps winning prizes in the right places uh, and people seem to be like oh it, it, but it it could suffer because well, the more people see it, they'll kind of go, well, that was a bit boring, wasn't it? So, so but I think it's between that film, uh, the one on uh, Netflix, Mank. Um, there's another great film called Promising Young Woman starring Kerry Mulligan. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's terrific in that. And that's a really bright film. And it's a film I've literally just seen called Judas and the Black Messiah, which I thought was absolutely fantastic, starring Daniel Kaluuya. Uh, as, a, as a Black Panther called Fred Hampton, and he's infiltrated by the FBI who are trying to sort of shut them down. Uh, I thought this was just a fab fabulous, fabulous, exciting, fresh film. Um, but I don't think it's got enough momentum to go all the way. The only one I see that's strong enough and political enough in this special year, because it's directed by a woman, and I think that the industry has decided that this is the year of the woman director, uh, that Chloe Zhao is the one who will be uh, anointed with this. Uh, we've seen it at the Golden Globes. You've got three women directors who have been nominated for the first time. All good things. It's great stuff. Um, but my, it's not my favourite film, Nomadland. But many people have been, you know, transported by it, which is apt because it's a film about a, a van going around America. <laughs> Thank you. We maybe put our money on that then. Yeah. Um, and final question, because it is our local choice. Um, what about Riz Ahmed this year for an award? Well, he already won a, a very prestigious award last night at the London Critics Circle Awards. He got our British Actor of the Year, which is for his body of work, Sound of Metal, the film that I think will get him an Oscar nomination. I do. I don't think he'll win Best Actor but because it's his first time and to play the game a bit more. But I, I think, you know, he's terrific. I love Riz. Um, we've met many times. Um, eventually, we found out, obviously, there was a Taylor's connection. Um, I think he didn't used to really play on it much. He used to sort of say he was from the streets a bit more, uh, <laughs> rather than like, <laughs> rather than Sandy Lodge, Dewfree Road. The slightly <laughs> meaner streets. Um, but um, yeah, he's a lovely boy. And he's becoming a really really gifted actor writer producer he's doing all the right things he's nurturing young british asian talent uh i love his uh sort of vulnerability i think he's got a great screen face he's got like a camel eyebrow camel eyelashes that sort of are uh, sort of vulnerable and doe-eyed but yeah he can be fierce in the sound of metal he's this drummer heavy metal drummer who goes deaf from the sound of his drums and he it's a very difficult role to play and he's terrific in it. And the British film Mogul Mowgli that he's in when he plays a young British Pakistani rapper, he, I think he's a, a fabulous in that. 
So, yeah, I'm really proud of him, uh, as we all are, obviously. Uh, and I wish him the best. I think, you know, he's already got a Golden Globe nomination this week. As I say, he won the London Critics Circle Award. Uh, and I think, yeah, he's going to be the next... Um, uh, the next Brit after, you know, we've been, done pretty well with Daniel Kaluuya over the years and John Boyega kind of coming up. But in terms of British Asian recognition, um, the Golden Globes have got Riz and Dev Patel, not a North London uh, Asian boy. Uh, I, I can't remember that ever happening before. So I think we are seeing a, a real, this year, this strange year where the big players have kind of come out of the game. We're seeing with female directors, diverse talent flourishing in the indie sector. And getting getting their dues at the at the sort of big awards, uh, and I, you know I think that Riz is going to seize it with both hands. So yes, uh, it, it, I'd love him to go all the way, but um, I, I don't think this is here for that sound of metal. It's too too edgy a performance. It's like some people will kind of go, ah, but he's got the muscle and he's got the talent and he's got the uh, the humility to to go all the way. Fantastic, thank you. And thank you so much, Jason. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to you. We could probably listen all night and um, we'd still have loads and loads of questions. Well, well can I, there's one thing I did want to say is that um, the, the boys did a fabulous job um, uh, of interviewing me and getting that. So, you know, I know that one thing I would say about Taylor, when I was there, there wasn't much encouragement to become a film critic or a journalist or anything like that. I'm not saying it was frowned upon, but it just wasn't a thing, you know? Uh, it wasn't what most people were going on to do. Uh, and I, you know, it's, you know, it's, I've managed to do it for 25 odd years and I've really enjoyed it. And I feel like I've done something interesting that I'm interested and passionate about and people like to, to, to get involved with it. So if you want to do it, do it. That sounds like very sound advice. <laughs> but I, and I also just want to say thank you to the boys as well. You've been amazing, really professional, well prepared, cool as a cucumber. And um, I'm really grateful for that and very grateful to you, Jason. And I've had some great comments from everyone. I'm sure everybody would like to give a round of applause in a virtual way. <laughs> um, and yes, thank you very much indeed. And just a point of notice, we've got another talk um, on the 24th of February with some very recent leavers who've been on an amazing expedition to the island of Senja in Norway. Um, and that's on the 24th of February. And apart from that, um, safe journey home. Oh yes, I will subscribe <laughs> to my podcast so that if you don't like, if you don't like La La Land, let's continue the arguments uh, on the podcast if you subscribe every week we can have this debate which is, is what it's all about so yes it's seen any good films lately on apple and uh spotify as the boys said uh, and that's where you that's that's the, the direct line to me <laughs> and i will include that link in an email to everyone oh too. thank you brilliant so that that would be perfect thank you so much and have a good evening everyone thank <laughs> you thanks, Emma. thank you thanks jason Thank you very much.